field of sensing. So uh, this will be the, again, the first Sinos meeting after the pandemic. We've had a couple of webinars, but we never had a, a annual conference. So let's hope it goes out well. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Ambika is uh, still not there. So are so, we going to start with yeah, the next speaker? Actually, Dr. Priyadarshini would be speaking uh, in place of Dr. Ambika. No uh, 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 Dr. Ambika expressed regret because of some personal reasons and Dr. Uh, Durga would be, would be speaking. Yeah, I'll be talking. Okay. okay, okay, sir. So what I'll do, I'll just uh, quickly introduce, uh, I mean, give the uh, formal introduction and I'll hand it over to you and then uh, you can uh, take it forward and you can invite all the uh, speakers. Sure. sure. Okay, sir. So I think uh, we are uh, uh, on time. Shall we begin? Yes, I think so. AV team, give us a cue. Good, ma'am. You can start, ma'am. Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome you to uh, the 72nd Annual DOS International Hybrid Conference 2021 on this lovely Sunday morning, the Grand Academic Festival Week. Uh, so this is uh, day eight, the last day of this conference, and we are live from Hall M. I'm your host, Sneha Vaghatkar. And uh, to our convener, uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena, is with us along with uh, the moderators. And I request uh, Dr. Saxena to take this forward. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sneha. And uh, thank you to uh, Delhi Ophthalmological Society for giving us the opportunity. So, this is the Indian Neuro Ophthalmology Society session in DOS. Uh, it's a virtual session. And we hope that uh, besides this panel here, a lot of uh, our members and others would, would be listening to this very, very interesting session. This is essentially for postgraduates, general ophthalmologists, and those who are interested in neuro ophthalmology. And uh, of course, we have some very eminent speakers in our midst, and the panel is also uh, experts in the field of neuro ophthalmology. So, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, before we start, of course, I just wanted to uh, highlight that. Uh, the Indian Neuro Ophthalmology Society will be holding its annual conference on uh, 23rd and 24th of October at uh, uh, Jawaharlal Auditorium, New Delhi, Ames, New Delhi. And it's a hybrid event and we are circulating the information. And we hope that in the course of this during discussion, I'll put the flyer up again. And uh, we hope that uh, many of you can actually participate physically or online uh, during the event. So. Uh, welcome everybody and I particularly want to welcome uh, our keynote speaker who has come all the way from uh, UK for this event and Dr. Saurabh Jain uh, who would be giving his keynote address and uh, of course all the other faculty and speakers who have taken out time to uh, be a part of uh, this session. Um, uh, Dr. Ambika who could not be here, uh, instead of that Dr. Durga would be speaking, Dr. Virinder Sachdev. Uh, from LVPI, Dr. Mahesh, uh, Dr. Naveen Jai Kumar, and Dr. Pradeep Sharma, all our eminent speakers. So uh, let's uh, start this session. I will invite the first speaker, Dr. Durga Priyadarshini from Shankar Netrale to give her talk on investigations and management of optic neuritis. Dr. Durga, please. Very good morning to one and all. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, INOS and the DOS team for giving me this opportunity. As Dr. Roy Saxena said, uh, due to unavoidable circumstances, Dr. Ambika is not available to join with us. So I'll be talking her, uh, talking, I mean, I'll be taking her talk today. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, just put them on full screen, please. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sure. May I start? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So today the talk is optic neuritis investigations and their management. Uh, optic neuritis has a well-known association with multiple sclerosis and, and our understanding of the central nervous system demyelinating disorders have significantly expanded over the past 15 years. First with the discovery of equiporin antibody and now with MOG antibodies. Given the overlap in the clinical presentation between the typical and the atypical neuritis, making an accurate diagnosis at the initial presentation is often challenging. 
but timely diagnosis is very important while evaluating these patients. So let me start with a short and an interesting case. 56 year old female came to us with a sudden painless drop in vision in the right eye three weeks back. And she's a known diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, the, vision, the visual equity in the right eye was counting fingers one meter and the left eye was six by six. The fundus examination showed a disc edema uh, with a peripatal hemorrhages in the right eye and the left eye was crowded. So she, she was diagnosed as a case of ischemic optic neuropathy in the right eye and she was just advised a control of systemic illness. She came back two weeks later with a drop in vision in the left eye and vision in the right eye was two by 60 and left eye was three by 60. The fundus examination now showed bilateral disc edema in both the eyes and the visual fields was constricted in both the eyes. Patient was advised an MRI brain and orbit, which was plain, which showed bilateral intraorbital optic nerve signals, uh, bright signals in the diffusion weighted image. So suspecting, uh, like it was suspicious, so we advised her to undergo a contrast enhanced MRI, which picked up the left optic nerve enhancing post contrast, and there was also thickening in the optic nerve. So patient was now advised a complete blood workup, including ischemic and an atypical optic neuritis, which included NMO and Morg antibody as well. The blood workup were all negative, except for Morg antibody, which became positive. So now we came to a conclusion that it is not an ischemic optic neuropathy, but a Morg associated optic neuritis. And so patient was advised to a uh, course of systemic, systemic, uh, systemic uh, steroids under the neurologist care. Post steroids, she came back one month later with a good recovery in the vision, both the eyes, and almost the fields had normalized. So, moving on to the discussion, typical and atypical, I'll be covering mostly the antibody mediated neuritis today. There are many clinical and radiological features which help, which help us differentiate the, these two entities. Looking at the clinical features, typical neuritis is associated with MS. There is more of female preponderance, median age is 20 to 30 years, and there is monocular vision loss usually associated with pain. And optic disc swelling is very rarely noted in these uh, patients. Atypical neuritis, it is associated with NMO spectrum disorders or Morg associated disease. There is usually profound vision loss, bilateral involvement is more common, and there is moderate to severe optic disc swelling in these, pa in these patients. So to uh, mention here, like one of a recent paper on optic neuritis patients with and without markers for Morg and NMO antibodies uh, got accepted and is under the process of publication. We found that the incidence of Morg optic neuritis is more than the NMO and MS in our population. And another interesting thing was like majority of the study patients were negative for both Morg and NMO, though they were not fitting in for MS criteria as well. So moving on to the first uh, one, the typical optic neuritis. ONTD is the best known study to describe this condition. Optic neuritis was associated with MS in 50% of the cases after 15 year follow-up period. And in 72% of the patient, if there was one or more lesions in the baseline MRI. The pathophysiology is unclear and there's no identified antibodies or target antigen. And MRI is the most relevant imaging study here. In MRI, the classic MS lesion, as we all know, is avoid, well demarcated and scattered with discontinuous distribution. And the optic nerve lesions uh, in MS are usually short and more anteriorly located. In the ancillary test, the CSF shows oligoclonal bands in more than 90% of the MS patients. And OCT has nowadays become a very important tool in demonstrating that axonal degeneration in MS can even happen in the absence of optic neuritis. And there is temporal, temporal RNFL preference in the uh, MS optic neuritis patient. And ganglion cell loss is also noted in the patients of post-neuritic cases. Moving on to the next one, the NMO spectrum disorders. It's a heterogeneous group of disease characterized by inflammation and demyelination of the optic nerve and the spinal cord. Aquaporin-4 antibodies target the aquaporin water channels on the astrocytic cells of the optic nerve and the spinal cord. And there are two subtypes, aquaporin antibody positive and aquaporin antibody negative. In aquaporin antibody positive NMO spectrum disorder, there should be one core clinical characteristic with the serum uh, positivity. And in aquaporin negative NMO spectrum disorder, there should be two core clinical characteristics. Looking at the MRI of NMO spectrum disorder, the optic nerve lesions are usually posterior and they are longer segment. And uh, there, are mo there is more uh, involvement of thiazine in these patients. 40 to 70% of the NMO spectrum disorders can have brain lesions and they're most commonly located in the periependymal region, hypothalamus, thalamus, and in the area posterior of the brainstem. The lesion in the brain are usually poorly defined and cloud -like, have a cloud-like appearance. In the spinal cord, the longitudinally extensive transverse myelite is very typically involving the central portion of the spinal cord. Aquaporin antibody detection is highly specific for NMO spectrum disorder and it is mostly detected in the serum. And cell-based assay is a very preferred technique here. 
In CSF, the NMO patients usually have more inflammatory cells than in MS, and oligoclonal bands are very rarely present, less than 20% of the patients can have. In OCT, the RNF of thinning is more severe in NMO spectrum disorders than in MS, and there is greater ganglion cell loss in NMO spectrum diseases. NMO, NMO patients affect the RNFL in all the quadrant, especially the superior and the inferior quadrant. Moving on to the more interesting one, the MOG associated disease, which is evolving now. The, it has a very broad range of clinical manifestations from optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, ADEM, and brainstem encephalitis. MOG antibodies were noted in patients with zero negative NMO spectrum disorders. And though the, the clinical presentation, response to therapy, and reproducible antibody in cell-based assay is never seen in patients with MS or antibody for NMO antibody positive uh, spectrum disorders. Optic neuritis is the most common presentation of the MOG associated disease. In MRI, they very classically have the enhancement of the optic nerve sheath and periorbital tissue in more than 50% of the cases. Both NMO and MOG involve more than half of the length of the optic nerve, but MOG have more of anterior involvement. MRI brain lesions are usually fluffy and the most common site is brainstem and around the fourth ventricle. In the transverse myelitis, they typically affect the, mostly they affect the conus medullaris and in the uh, MRI scan of the spine, they have the, the signal is mostly restricted to the gray matter producing something called as head sign. Moving on to the MOG antibody detection, uh, the antibody is uh, seen in the serum, likewise in uh, aquaporin antibody and cell-based assay is the preferred technique here too. And MOG antibody is reserved for atypical optic neuritis patients presenting with recurrence, bilateral involvement, severe vision loss, or severe dyskinema, and perineural enhancement of the MRI. And can also be done in MOG uh, equiporin negative NMO spectrum disorders or debilitating diseases that is atypical for MS. In CSF, they are either normal or pleocytosis noted. The differential count shows neutrophils predominance. OCB is typically not present in these patients. And anti-MOG antibodies never produce intrathically, so they are not absent in these patients. In OCT, the peripapillary RNF thickness is better than in epicorin positive NMO pa uh, positive patients. And there is no difference in macular RNF thickness between these two entities. To summarize, when do you suspect antibody-mediated neuritis? If there is bilateral involvement, severe vision loss at the onset, and then if, the, if there is severe dyskinema on presentation. Also suspect um, atypical neuritis if there is associated area postma syndrome like hiccups or vomiting on presentation. Radiologically, uh, we think of atypical neuritis if there is long optic nerve involvement, chiasmal involvement, or perineural enhancement in the MRI. Moving on to the treatment of optic neuritis, acute treatment is with uh, first-line therapy is with intravenous methylprednisolone, one gram for three to five days, and uh, followed by oral steroids. Oral steroids alone is usually not recommended, especially in typical neuritis due to the risk of recurrence. Very rapid response has been noted in patients with MOG associated disease, and usually one to two months tapering is recommended in these antibody-mediated neuritis because of the risk of relapse. Few studies have also told that earlier treatment with IVMP was associated with better outcome in aquaporin positive and MOG associated optic neuritis. Second line therapy is considered if there is not much improvement with the IV steroids and plasophoresis is noted to be equally efficacious and safe in NMO spectrum disorders and in MS. Early plex is noted to have better outcomes in equiporin positive NMO spectrum disorder, but its use in MOG is still unclear. But early plex prior to treatment with IV steroids is usually not recommended. Intravenous immunoglo immunoglobulin is another treatment for acute treatment modality, which is recommended for patients with severe disease and not responding to IV steroids. Going on to the long-term maintenance therapy, immunomodulator is significantly reducing the relapse in, in MS patients, but one should always remember the serious adverse effects associated, associated with them. All patients with equiporin positive NMO spectrum disorder require long-term immunosuppressants because of the high risk of relapse and poor recovery. Monoclonal antibody against the B-cell population are coming up as a targeted therapy for neuroma, uh, NMO spectrum disorders. And another important thing is immunomodulators is always avoided in NMO spectrum disorder patients because they are known to cause worse outcome in these patients. 50% of the patients with MOG associated disease will be monophasic and the recovery is much better than in NMO positive patients. Long-term immunotherapy for MOG associated disease can be typically reserved for relapsing patients and patients with significant disability due to previous attacks. It is unclear whether the immunomodulators will worsen MOG associated disease like in um, NMO spectrum disorders, though it is better to avoid in these patients because they are ineffective.
So to conclude, optic neuritis, be it typical or antibody mediated, they're present with clinical and radiological features, which help us differentiate between these three overlapping entities. MRI brain and orbit with contrast is a preferred imaging modality in these patients. Testing for echopotence should be considered for all patients with optic neuritis and testing for more antibodies can be more selective. Early diagnosis with a prompt treatment is important for the better visual recovery. Recent researches in NMO spectrum disorder have resulted in improved diagnosis and targeted therapy. Decision to initiate long-term immunotherapy for MOG associated diseases still evolving. Thank you. Uh, Over to you, Dr. Saxena. Uh, yeah, so thank you and uh, uh, an excellent presentation covering all the major aspects and giving us a good overview of how you should approach. Uh, we just take one or two comments uh, before we uh, start. Just there's one question, uh, uh, Dr. Durga, would you order along with the MRI brain and orbits at the first presentation of a patient with um, uh, sudden onset loss of vision, would you order an MRI of the spine also, or your first reflex would be only an MRI brain and orbits with contrast? Preferably MRI brain and orbit with contrast is my imaging model. I mean, first, I prefer MRI brain. And if they go in for relapses and they have other atypical features, uh, maybe area postuma or other signs of uh, transverse myelitis, maybe I will order for an MRI spine. I think there would be a broad agreement, at least in India, regarding this. So first time a patient comes, now it's almost mandatory if you suspect an optic neuritis to do an MRI brain in orbits with contrast, a flare sequence so that you can pick up demyelination in the periventricular area. Uh, so you will have the fat suppression also for the orbit so that you can clearly delineate the optic nerve. And uh, of course, there and then you start IV methylprednisolone and wait. Uh, once you get the imaging, you can take a call on, as Dr. Durga said, if there are any areas involved which may be suspicious of NMO or if the patient is not responding or it's very, very severe loss or at the very outset, there are atypical features which may uh, give an appearance that it's possibly not due to a demyelinating lesion. So there you start working up just the way Dr. Durga very wonderfully gave us information on. Any comment, uh, Dr. Goyal or anybody, and then we can just go on to the next uh, brief comment and we'll go on. We'll take discussions in the end. I wanted to know whether there is any experience of uh, uh, interferon in these patients of optic neuritis and plasma pheresis. Anyone? <laughs> Interferons may be considered uh, in uh, proven MS patients, sir, and better after ruling out NMO spectrum disorders in these patients. And uh, aspherosis, yes, uh, if there is not much improvement, maybe after one to two weeks of IV steroids, then maybe we can consider. Now, interferon, yes. what is the dose which we are using? Yes. Interferon? Interferon, we usually uh, give it sub subcutaneously, uh, you know, as a weekly dose, sir. The neurologist manages them. So uh, both interferon and flex are uh, managed in association with the neurologist. And yes, nowadays the neurologists have become very, very aggressive for both these interventions, especially in NMOSD. So uh, in optic, in multiple sclerosis, they may still wait for a, a bit. But uh, if it is an NMO confirmed, uh, uh, NMO positive patient who has not responded to IV methylprednisolone, uh, actually we transfer these patients to the neurology site for uh, uh, PLEX and then followed by a long-term interferon therapy as and when required. Nowadays we see that they are preferring the oral immunomodulators to interferons as well, sir. Right. So... Uh, I think we'll take discussion now uh, subsequently. There are a lot of questions and all that can be uh, discussed. So I'll go on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Virender Sajdeva from uh, LV Prasad, uh, a very ardent and passionate neuro-ophthalmologist. He'll be talking to us about approach to optic atrophy. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ravid, for kind introduction. Uh, am I audible and slides are visible? Yes, yes sir, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rohit, INOS team and uh, DOS team for giving the opportunity. I think optic atrophy is one of the quite common presentations that we come across in neuro-ophthalmology clinics being referred to as cases of temporal pallor or optic atrophy. But uh, there is a lot of to evaluate in a patient with optic atrophy. We all know that optic atrophy is just a sign 
and it's not the final diagnosis. It just reflects that some optic nerve insult has happened that has led to the loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And a lot needs to be elicited that what is the underlying etiology and that could alter the prognosis of the patient. Again, optic atrophy could take various patterns like temporal pallor, a patient with postpapilledema optic atrophy, optic atrophy with significant attenuation of blood vessels and with, uh, with associated retinal findings. So how do we approach them? We'll go through this with a case test manner. Before that, I would like to just highlight that there are various terms that are used to describe the etiology of optic atrophy. In the past, terms like primary, secondary, consecutive glaucomatous, and cavernous optic atrophy have been very popular. Only drawback with this kind of uh, description is that same disease such as retrobulbar neuritis and papillitis occurring in optic neuritis would give rise to primary and secondary optic atrophy. So it does not clearly distinguish between different etiologies. So what we can propose is that we can subclassify optic atrophy as post-traumatic and non-traumatic. And non-traumatic can be subclassified according to the final diagnosis, like ischemic, post-neurotic, compressive, consecutive, hereditary optic neur uh, neuropathies. So this is one point that we can keep in our mind. The objectives of my talk will be to highlight common etiologies of optic atrophy some of the mimickers of optic atrophy and to elucidate the patterns and pointers to etiology of optic atrophy. So let's do it in a case-based manner. This is the first case, a patient with temporal pallor referred to our clinic. The patient is a 24-year-old lady referred for evaluation of optic atrophy. Her visual acuity was 2016 in both eyes. There was no relative afferent pupillary defect and color vision was subnormal in both eyes. So with this fundus picture, the rest of the retina was normal and there was definitely temporal pallor in both optic nerves. We went back and asked for history. There was history of sudden onset vision loss in both eyes few years ago. There was history of definite febrile episode prior to this. MRI brain had been obtained. The films were not available, but it was normal. And she was treated with some tablets and there was slow recovery. So how do we proceed further? We do a visual field and it does show that there is a central scotoma in both eyes. Further, visually evoked potentials of the patient showed that waveforms were reproducible even up to the small sizes, like the seven minutes of our checkerboard pattern. And the amplitudes are slightly reduced. But what is, uh, what is remarkable is that the P100 implicit time is prolonged in both eyes, suggesting that it was possibly a demyelinating optic neuritis. So this is the first clue. Could there be other differential diagnosis of this patient? Uh, well, yes. Let's see in detail. Uh, a similar patient presenting to us with temporal pallor, a young male having a sequential involvement of optic nerves, right eye followed by left or vice versa, and more subnormal vision like 2200 or so, could very well be labor's hereditary optic neuropathy and we should keep it in mind. A person presenting to us with acute vision loss following, following ingestion of a toxic substance such as ATT or linezolate or antiretroviral drugs could be having a toxic optic neuropathy. A gradual onset vision loss with this kind of presentation in a person who is strict vegetarian or has GI absorption problems could be a nutritional optic neuropathy. And a person presenting again with gradual onset vision loss without any other such histories, but a family history or showing a, a pallor on the evaluation of parents would be hereditary optic neuropathy. There could be some other clues to hereditary optic neuropathy. For example, consanguinity among parents, history of diabetes, and sensory neural hearing loss, which could suggest that this person could be actually be a, one of the forms of hereditary optic neuropathies. So to reiterate, a person presenting to us with temporal pallor and central or centrocecal scotomas, keep in mind at least five etiologies, post toxic, hereditary, labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, and nutritional causes. We'll move on to the second pattern. Uh, well, the second pattern is that of a temporal pallor along with a bitemporal hemianopia on visual fields. So in this, what also is remarkable is that the pallor is slightly asymmetric. We can make out that the pallor is more on the left side, at least in the red free photographs, and there is definite bitemporal hemianopic field effect. Well, this localizes very well to the 
chiasmal area and tumors such as craniopharyngeoma, pituitary macroadenoma, and meningiomas of paracellular area would be very important. And these patients will definitely need a neuroimaging. Coming to the third pattern. Uh, this is a case of a 10-year-old girl. She was recently detected to have vision loss in left eye one month ago. And the, her best corrected visual acuity was 20-20 right eye and light perception left eye. Interior segment was normal except for RAPD. Right eye fundus was normal, but in the left eye, apart from optic atrophy, we can observe that there is severe retination of blood vessels. And apart from that, there is diffuse RP changes in the posterior pole and extending to the mid periphery. Well, this is a patient with a classical picture of ophthalmic artery occlusion. And such patients do not need neuroimaging, but rather need a workup to find out the vasculopathic risk factors. So check for hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia. In a young patient, it could be familial hypertriglyceridemia, hyperhomocystinemia, and abnormalities of cardiovascular circulation. We should do a complete workup for them. These patients could also be secondary to central retinal artery occlusion and a picture from the acute presentation could be very useful or could be status post NAIMN where the pallor would be segmental and the changes like attenuated blood vessels and RP changes will be in a localized area usually. Coming to the fourth pattern, we see in this picture a patient with partial optic atrophy. We can see the pallor uh, present more diffusely. Apart from that, we can appreciate attenuation of blood vessels and in the peripapillary area, RPE changes. These patients are suggestive of the fact that there was sometimes swelling of the disc and it can be given a pattern, uh, the name of post optic atrophy. Well, it signifies that there was raised intracranial pressure sometime and it could be an intracranial space occupying lesion, diffuse infection, which definitely requires neuroimaging and the patients could have different presentations like in the first picture, status posterior meningitis, posterior fossa tumors, hydrocephalus, and IAH or Arnold Carey like malformation. So neuroimaging is very much important for this pattern. The last pattern is that of a optic atrophy along with significant changes in the retina. For example, laser marks, for example, RP changes, for example, CRA patches. It signifies consecutive optic atrophy and it is significantly highlighting that it's a primarily retinal pathology or it could be a part of a neurometabolic disorder. So appropriate history, failure to thrive, nystagmus, and detailed retinal examination will be very useful in these patients. We should be aware that some of the optic nerve malformations could mimic an optic atrophy and could be missed on a wide field view or indirect ophthalmoscopy, but a high magnification view will easily tell that the optic nerve size will be different or there is an optic disc spit that could be there. For example, in this patient, it's optic disc hyperplasia with double ring sign, and it is important to do a further workup and identify systemic associations. So, how do we approach a patient with optic atrophy? First, rule out optic atrophy mimics. Look at the patterns, take a detailed history, establish the pattern that you are seeing, obtain visual fields, which is very useful, and tailor made the investigations according to the presentation. We have seen in the course of presentation visual fields like central scotomas, altitudinal field effects bitemporal hemianopia are pointers to where the lesion could be and give clues to the etiology. And I would like to conclude by presenting this slide, highlighting the five patterns again, temporal pallor with central central secret scotoma. Remember five etiologies, post nutritional, toxic, hereditary, and LHON. Asymmetric temporal pallor with bitemporal hemianopia, suggestive of chiasmal compression. These definitely need neuroimaging. Diffuse pallor with attenuated blood vessels and gliosis. Look for vascular occlusion. Disc pallor with peripapillary pigmentary changes and gliotic changes. post papillary optic atrophy and coexisting retinal abnormalities suggesting consecutive optic atrophy. Thank you very much for a patient hearing and the opportunity. Thank you, Virender. Again, uh, uh, as always, a very excellent comprehensive coverage of uh, optic atrophy, how to approach. And uh, often, uh, I mean, you generally read in textbooks that optic atrophy is optic atrophy and it doesn't reveal much. But as you have shown us that uh, a good workup and a proper examination can actually give us a well-directed approach to the investigations we need to do. And of course, it's not that always we will be correct, but it will always help us to have a starting point for the investigations we need to. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ashwin. Uh, He's the vice president of INOS and uh, 
any comments, Rashmin, and uh, on the topic that has been discussed, and uh, then we'll go on to the next speaker. So thank you. Yeah. Splendor uh, covered it so well, beautifully covered. And one point I think which we, we have, would have to stress, especially to, to residents and general ophthalmologists, is that optic atrophy is the end point of any diseases. It's not a disease, it's a sign. And so, as Virinder said, you look at it carefully and then chase as to why a patient has an optic atrophy. That's something which has to be looked at. Otherwise, fantastic uh, presentation, Virinder. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin and Dr. Rahit. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, one more, uh, one thing yeah. I want to emphasize <clears throat> that uh, he has shown bitemporal hemianopia. No? That slide, uh, it was showing um, the denser hem, uh, field defect in the interior part. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a lighter field defect in the superior part. So that means if there is a denser field defect in the interior part, think of craniopharyngioma. Because the chiasma can be compressed from above, that is craniopharyngioma, or it can be compressed from below, then the field defect will be denser in the superior part as compared to inferior part, so that uh, we should look for the pituitary adenoma. So that was one point I wanted to emphasize. Thank you, yes. I mean, from a, a postgraduate point of view, it becomes an important uh, point to recognize where the fields are denser, probably that's the initially involved part of the field or the initially involved part of the fibers, uh, corresponding fibers, giving us an idea as to what the possible etiology may be. Yeah, 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 excellent talk, Dr. Virender. I just wanted to add a small point about uh, bout eye atrophy. Bout eye atrophy, especially in the, from the postgraduate point of view, uh, is also suggestive of a chiasmal involvement because of the arrangement of the retinal uh, nerve fibers, uh, which is temporal and nasal to the fixation point. So bout eye atrophy may possibly be seen in chiasmal uh, lesions. That's just for the postgraduates. Very well added points, Dr. Goel and Dr. Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the uh, next speaker, which is uh, Mahesh. Uh, Dr. Mahesh Kumar will be speaking on managing diplopia. Uh, again, another very passionate, very hardworking uh, neuro ophthalmologist. You should see his clinic to believe the number of patients he's able to see and pack in a day. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahesh, please. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Rohit. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the team members of uh, Indian Neuroophthalmic Society as well as uh, the Delhi Ophthalmic Society for having invited me here. So I've, I have tweaked the topic slightly, what was given to me. I've just added uh, evaluation as well as management of diplopia uh, in a few, few more slides. So uh, the objectives of my presentation will be uh, while evaluating we need to differentiate between monocular and binocular double vision because that has a bearing on the management of this uh, diplopia. And we need to uh, uh, realize the importance of history taking in uh, diplopia, which will give us a clue, as well as the clinical evaluation, the salient points, and arriving at the possible cause of the double vision. And finally, with all these aspects, we will uh, arrive at the management of uh, double vision. So the most important point is, uh, monocular versus binocular uh, double vision because that is a direct bearing on the management. So monocular double vision uh, is something which, uh, binocular double vision is something which disappears on closing one eye and monocular double vision is something which on closing one eye diplopia is still present. It, it is still, if you close the left eye, it is still present. It is present in the right eye. And sometimes if it disappears in the right eye, then we have to tell the patient to close the right eye again and make sure the diplopia is not present in the left eye as well because that monocular double vision could be present in either eye and we need to make sure that sequentially we close uh, one eye after the other to make sure it's not a monocular double vision. And the most important point of view here is a monocular double vision is relieved with pinhole. Why it is relieved with pinhole is that anything, uh, what uh, pinhole relieves anything which has got, got something to do with the refractive media. So, uh, it, it goes without saying that monocular double vision is something to do with the refractive media. It can, it can be right from the lids, cornea, or the lens, or, the, or even sometimes even the retina. Whereas binocular double vision, it dis diplopia disappears on closing uh, either eye. 
we got stuck and uh, it could it need not always be neurogenic it can be a restrictive cause or it can be a neuromuscular junction or it could be a neurogenic cause so these are some of the examples of uh, monocular double vision uh, for the postgraduates it's easy to remember whenever somebody asks you you go from anterior to posterior so which means something you go from the lids something pressing on the cornea like the like a clazion uh, which can cause uh, abnormal astigmatism or a keratoconus or a corneal opacity or uh, a large peripheral iridectomy in this case it's a inferior iridectomy possibly for a silicon oil they might, they might have done even if it is a superior iridectomy if it encroaches near the pupillary margin like this and then it can potentially cause a monocular double vision a subluxated lens or a subluxated eye oil they have two refractive uh, media and so they can have monocular double vision and the moment we have this then the management is something to do with uh, relieving this problem and not necessarily going for a binocular correction or whatever other things which we will see subsequently uh, one thing we have to remember is a cataract also can cause a monocular double vision many times patients say that they you see multiple images a polyopia because of scattering of light due to the immature cortical fibers there is a rare cause of monocular diplopia which is not improving with pinhole which is to do with a cerebral polyopia uh, and uh, it is a bilateral monocular revolution meaning that it is present on each eye on closing separately each eye and it is seen in some cases of recovering stages of cortical blindness encephalitis uh, ms and tumor etc so uh, binocular double vision the management is directed at relieving the symptoms of uh, double vision and uh, sometimes relieving the squint the patient may come to us with squint they may simply come to us with blurred vision when looking in a particular direction so uh, and sometimes they will simply say giddiness without realizing that it is due to uh, double vision so our management will be aimed at uh, relieving these uh, symptoms basically and when possible a uh, uh, structural correction of uh, squint so the main goal will be to treat the symptoms of diplopia and ocular deviation by increasing the field of binocular single vision so whatever method we are doing by orthoptic correction or prisms or whatever it will be seeing or a surgical correction this is our ultimate goal is to increase the field of the binocular single vision so the binocular double vision could be neurogenic as we said it could be central peripheral uh, myasthenia or it could be restrictive like a blow fracture or thyroid related orbitopathies where uh, there will be uh, a restrictive nature uh, due to a uh, enlarged muscle or entrapped muscle so some a small clue is to see the abrupt uh, stoppage of the uh, ocular movements as we test the uh, duction movements then uh, history no uh, regardless to say that it is uh, most important to see whether the images are separated horizontally or vertically which will give us a clue to the possible muscle involvement and is the diplopia variable if it is in the evening we know that it's myasthenia if it is diplopia is way is more in the morning we know it's likely related to thyroid related orbitopathy due to overnight stagnation next the examination uh, head posture will tell us a lot of uh, uh, give us a lot of clues uh, whether it's a face turn a horizontal muscle or a head tilt or a chin depression it will give us a lot of clues always look at the fellow travelers like uh, a tosis which may be myasthenia or thyroid palsy or a pupil involvement which could be uh, giving us a clue to the uh, possible uh, investigations that will be required a pupil involved thyroid palsy we might require which will be covered subsequently uh, mri and mr angiogram to rule out aneurysms and look at the eye as a whole here there is an anophthalmos with some degree of subconjunctival hemorrhage with a history of trauma possibly a blowout fracture look at the fellow travelers look at the possible aberrant regeneration the aberrant regeneration will give us a clue that we are possibly dealing with a surgical here you can see the change in the palpable fissure bit uh, and also a lid lag on down gaze now you can see that lid lag on down gaze all these are suggestive of uh, suggestive of uh, aberrant regeneration which gives us a clue to a surgical palsy the six no palsy the most important thing to be look for is a raised intracranial pressure look for a papilledema look for other cranial palsies to rule out skull based tumors do not miss mimicus 
uh, like Duane's retraction syndrome and sixth nerve palsy. So uh, if it is more than one single cranial nerve palsy, always neuro image. And if pupil is involved, we have to rule out structural lesions, could be aneurysms or, uh, or even tumors. Sixth nerve palsy rule out increased ICT and fourth nerve palsy rule out congenital as a differential diagnosis by means of large vertical fusional amplitudes. And remember, myasthenia can be a great mimicker. And also remember that if there's a sensory impairment or pupil involvement, it is never myasthenia. So the management is directed. It can be conservative or surgical. So conservative management when in small deviations. And if it is a diabetic nerve palsy, we wait for about three months for spontaneous neck recovery, provided it is a mono neuropathy. And uh, in acute stages, while well, observing for the recovery, especially in uh, ischemic no mono neuropathies like diabetic nerve palsies, and individuals where surgery is contraindicated in the long term, then we can do uh, conservative management. Like initially, any binocular double vision, occlusion is a mainstay of treatment. And also to improve the recovery rates, adduction and version exercises. Then further down, we can give prisms. We can uh, give botulinum toxins in certain situations. So occlusion is typically done in the involved eye. For example, if it's a sixth nerve palsy, uh, the involved eye is always typically occluded as the patient moves outdoors. But during indoors also, we need to occlude the good eye. Why? Because we need to prevent amblyopia in children. And also, occlusion is done in the um, good eye to prevent contraction of the antagonist. We have to force the involved eye to try to take a fixation. For example, if a medial rectus is the lateral rectus palsy, medial rectus is overacting, we need to move the medial rectus to some extent and we need to close the good eye to make the patient try to fixate with the uh, involved eye to prevent contraction of the antagonist. Alternate eye occlusion is uh, done in children to prevent occlusion amblyopia in the good eye. Active duction exercises to restore the strength in a weakened muscle like a physiotherapy. Tell them to move the uh, muscles in the direction of the involved uh, uh, paratic muscle uh, daily about, about 10 minutes morning and evening. We can tell them to do. Active version exercises are done to extend the area of fusion by changing the head or ocular position while maintaining the fusion. So we try to maintain a binocular single vision uh, and increasing the field of binocular single vision by active version exercises. Prisms are given in some patients as temporary relief who cannot tolerate the diplopia. Small de in small deviations we can give, especially in superior oblique paresis and can be incorporated in the spectacles or as frenal prisms. So these are some examples of uh, frenal prisms being cut and incorporated in the uh, spectacles the patient is using. The advantage is it is temporary and it can be removed as well. This is an example of frenal prisms for a fourth nerve palsy, a base down prism in a case of a fourth nerve palsy. Botulinum toxins are used when there is no improvement and to prevent contractions of the uh, overacting antagonist as we saw previously. For example, in lateral rectus to prevent medial rectus contraction, preferably not done in diabetic nerve palsies. And it is, uh, it is can be used in traumatic nerve palsies. And uh, typically 2.5 to 10 units per muscle can be tried. And uh, surgical, the goals of surgical management will be to improve the head position, to offer binocular single vision and to increase the field of binocular single vision. Thank you very much. presentation. I think we'll go on to the next speaker and uh, discuss uh, all diplopia, paralytic strabismus and all after uh, I think the two speakers, Dr. Pradeepshan and Dr. Saurabh Jain, complete their uh, paralytic workup and management discussion. So we'll go on to the uh, next speaker, Dr. Naveen Jaikumar, uh, who will be talking about imaging in neuroophthalmic disorders. Uh, I've frequently heard him and it's one of the uh, best presentations for understanding how to image for ophthalmologists. And of course, Dr. Naveen's vast experience always helps in ease of understanding to any listener. So uh, Dr. Naveen Jaikumar, please. Dr. Naveen, you are mute, so... Uh, 
can you, uh, Rohit, can you confirm that you can see the slides? Yes, sir. We can see the slides and now you're audible, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. The topic I'm going to speak on is neuroimaging for ophthalmologists. And uh, I thought I would start with the inverse question as to when uh, neuroimaging is not absolutely essential to make a diagnosis. So let me just uh, run you through a few examples. Here is this patient uh, with a disc uh, swelling. And you can see on an ultrasound that there is a hyper intense spot over the optic disc on the B scan. And you can see a high reflective spike on the A scan. But what is interesting is on the low gain, when you lower the strength of the ultrasound waves, this particular spot on the disc is still visible while everything else has virtually disappeared. And you can see the spike still remains. And this confirms to us that uh, this is an optic nerve hydrosin. So you don't need to do a CT scan to pick up the calcium deposit on the uh, optic nerve head. You can just use the ultrasound in your clinic. There are a couple of other instances in orbital disease, for example, where ultrasonography still has an important role to play just to help you to come to a diagnosis. For example, in the first picture on your left, you can see uh, a thickened extraocular muscle with the yellow arrow, but with a tendon spared shown in the blue arrow, indicating that this is thyroid ophthalmopathy in a patient with proptosis. Another patient with proptosis and chemosis you might see this worm-like structure there uh, on, on above in the upper part of the eye. And this is a dilated superior ophthalmic vein, which would tell you this is a carotico-cavernous fistula. In the third patient with a painful proptosis, uh, what is visible is uh, an extraocular muscle thickening, but you can see a central white dot, uh, hyper-reflective uh, hyper area there, dot with a increased hyperreflective spike inside the muscle. This is very characteristic of a scolex in extraocular muscle cysticercosis. So here are some examples where a simple ultrasound test would help you to make a diagnosis. As far as bone and calcium in neuroimaging are concerned between CT and MRI, we have to remember that MRI does not image calcium. You can see the teeth in the jaw here. In the palate, you can see it's looking black because MRI, uh, the reason MRI does not image calcium is that because bone and, and teeth contain very little water uh, and MRI picks up hydrogen protons in water. So because there's nothing there, it just turns out looking black. So this has disadvantages as well as certain advantages, which we should see shortly. There is calcium in the orbit. Yes, certain diseases you can CT, you can get away with, like in this patient where, with bilateral uh, swellings, uh, intraocular retinal swellings, which is retinoblastoma. You can see the calcium specks there. And here is a patient, another child, where there's extreme proptosis. So the globe itself is not visible in this particular uh, coronal section. Instead, you see this huge orbital mass, which is broken through all the walls of the orbit, the roof, the floor, the medial, as well as the lateral wall, and extending to the side of the face as well. This child, unfortunately, had rhabdomyosarcoma. So calcium can be very, very well visualized on CT scan, which is basically an X-ray based technology. Now, in this particular image in a patient with injury, what is characteristic is compared to the previous CTs here that you saw is here you could see the soft tissue quite well. Here the soft tissue is barely visible. You can just about see the outlines of the eyeballs etc. But what is striking is the bone and also the internal structure of the bone. So let's look at the fractures first. You can see the medial wall fracture in this patient with trauma. You can very clearly see the trapdoor fracture of the floor of the object your attention to this particular area of the CT scan, where you can actually see the internal structure of the bone. Normally, on an ordinary CT, it would look like this, a totally white structure. So this kind of CT is called a CT scan with bone window, where the CT parameters are adjusted to capture the bone uh, structural components rather than the soft tissue components. 
So this is very useful in, in trauma, not only in trauma, but also in bony lesions involving uh, orbital, orbit, etc., like osteomas, etc. Okay, so this is CT with bone window. Don't forget to ask for this. The radiologist would do it, but it's good for you to know as well. Here is an example of a 3D CT. And in this patient, you can, in this child, you can very clearly see the uh, coronal suture is already closed on the right side. It's an asymmetric closure. The coronal suture is still a little open on the left side as well as the sagittal suture. But this side, it is shut. So this very clearly shows that it is a patient with Cruzon's disease. As far as the orbital apex, the superior orbital fissure and cavernous sinus are concerned, these, uh, you must remember, are very small regions. Okay, And because of the very small region and the density of the bone especially, for example, orbital apex has got a lot of bone compared to the soft tissue. The soft tissue is only basically the origins of your extraocular muscles, the optic nerve and a couple of cranial nerves and the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein. But these are nothing compared to the density of the sphenoid bone in that region. So you can see here in this arrow or the MRI, you can very, very clearly see the soft tissue uh, in the orbital apex, superior orbital fissure. That is the superior orbital fissure where the arrow is pointing to. And the reason you're able to see this so clearly is that MRI does not image the dense sphenoid bone. Take a look at the same area here on the CT scan. You can barely see any soft tissue because the, the bone is looking incandescently white there and obstructing any other views. Okay. Yeah. In this particular area, this is the optic canal. You can see the entirety of the optic nerve uh, stretching right from behind the globe all the way to the chiasm and especially more importantly passing through the optic canal which is very clearly visible. You can't see that on the CT. Looking little beyond the superior orbital fissure, you can even see down, you can see the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus where the arrow is pointing to and inside the cavernous sinus, you can see the internal carotid artery as well. So for such cavernous sinus lesions can often be very subtle and doing an MRI with high resolution uh, uh, imaging at this area is important as well. As far as optic neuritis is concerned, the MRI not only has a diagnostic significance, it also has a prognostic significance. Let's see how that works. So here in this picture, you can very, very clearly see compared to the picture now on, on, the, on the right side of your screen, that the orbital fat on a T2 image, T2 images are the one we use to look at pathology. Now you can see in the T2 image, the fat is looking so bright. So if you're trying to look at the optic nerve and the hyper intensity of the optic nerve, it won't be very clearly visible because that will also look white and the fat is also looking bright. So there's not much of contrast. However, you can increase the contrast by suppressing the image from the fat. So this is called fat suppression okay, or spur or stir images. So now that the fat signal is suppressed, you can very clearly see the hyper intense optic nerve here in the mid orbit going all the way into the optic canal. You could also, this is the same patient in, uh, in which it is a T1 image and this time you injected a gadolinium as well. The fat is still suppressed and very clearly you can see the enhancement of the optic nerve for the mid-orbit going up to the orbital apex and the optic canal as well. Now, where is the prognostic part of it? For example, in, the same, in another patient of this where you do an MRI, you also do the brain and you can very clearly see these demyelinating patches uh, above the corpus callosum. These are called Dawson's fingers and are very characteristic of multiple sclerosis. So that changes the, uh, the prognosis for the patient and the way you'll manage the patient rather than an isolated optic neuritis. This is optic neuritis as part of MS. So that will influence your prognosis and influence the way you manage. So that's why MRI is useful, not only for diagnosis, but also for prognosis. Uh, the other kind of imaging which is very useful on an MRI is to suppress the water. 
just like we suppress fat in the orbit, we can suppress the water and the CSF and the subarachnoid space. And you can see images. Now, in this particular picture that you're seeing, it looks kind of normal. Even if you try and look around the lateral ventricles, it is fine. But just imagine if I turn off the signals coming from the water and the lateral ventricles, how would that look? It would look like this. And now you can very clearly see the slightly feathery area on the right lateral ventricle anterior tip. You can see that absolutely looking bright on this image. It's called a flare image of fluid attenuation inversion recovery. Whenever you see the letters IR, as in stir in orbit or flare in the brain, inversion recovery, inversion recovery means something is being suppressed, whether it is fat in the orbit or fluid in the brain. So that's how you can see an MS plaque much better using flare images. In papilledema, commonly we end up with trying to figure out if it's an intracranial space occupying lesion or an idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So you do a neuroimaging. But importantly, in assuming that there is no tumor in the brain which is producing the papilledema, it's important to uh, inform the radiologist and please order an MR venogram as well. So here is a patient with a normal left transverse sinus. In a, uh, and here on the other side, is a patient where you can clearly see the left transverse sinus is hypoplastic. This is not a, a not uncommon finding in patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So don't forget to ask for an MR venogram. It not only shows you dural uh, venous sinus hypoplasia, it can also show you venous sinus thrombosis, which can also be a cause of raised intracranial pressure. As far as cranial nerve pathologies are concerned, in this particular patient, here is a patient who had a left pupil involved third nerve palsy plus aberrant regeneration of the third nerve plus a sixth nerve palsy. And you can see this very large signal void, a black area in the cavernous sinus. Uh, you can see the corresponding side on the right side showing the right internal carotid artery. On the left side, you can see that same artery is extremely enlarged. This is a ICA aneurysm here. So please ask for MR angiography in any case of cranial nerve palsy. So here in this case, in an MR angio, you can very clearly see a giant LICA aneurysm. Okay, so this is a patient with left hemifacial spasm. Normally one may not do an MRI, but it is useful to do it to find out if there's anything irritating the facial nerve on that particular side. What you see in this image is the cistern. So this is the pons, the middle cerebral peduncle and the cerebellum behind the fourth ventricle. But what stands out is this brilliantly lit up uh, three pontine cistern and the CP angle. The CSF is glowing white. And against back white, intensely white background, you can see these thread-like cranial nerves. Okay, This happens to be the abducens nerve. This happens to be the facial nerve going this way. And here on the left side, you can very clearly see the facial nerve, which is this. And next to that is an anomalous vascular loop, which is irritating the facial nerve, which indicates the cause of the hemifacial spasm in this particular patient. So this kind of imaging is called an assis or a fiesta image. Either of these terms are fine. It just depends on whether it's a Siemens machine or a GE machine. Uh, but asking your radiologist for a cis or a fiesta image is useful in a hemifacial spasm. In far as chiasmal lesions are concerned, is CT important or okay. MRI important or both are needed? So here, for example, you can see calcification on the CT scan. But on the MRI, you can see the extent of the axial and paracellar and posterior extensions. And very clearly in the sagittal view, you can see the vertical extent but also the fact that it is looking extremely, this is a T1 image and it's looking bright, hyper intense. Very few things look hyper intense on T1 images and one of these is fat. So the thing of a machine oil consistency inside a tumor with calcification points to a craniopharyngioma. So in conclusion, um, I thought I just put this up. This is a personal view. I'm sure people have their own ideas. But as a primary, to emphasize the word primary, if you look at these various conditions that I described, 
I think CT scan still has a role to play in orbit and paranasal sinus disease and to a certain extent in chiasmal lesions. But in everything else, I think uh, an MRI is absolutely essential. CT scan has a very, very little role to play in everything else. But also importantly for all of you to remember, don't just write MRI brain for all this. Please add these other terms uh, with contrast or with MR venogram or this cranial nerve palsy with an MR angio. Uh, and for cavernous sinus, please indicate to them that you're interested in the cavernous sinus region so that they look at things carefully. Uh, I asked this long ago to a neurosurgeon colleague of mine, which one would you choose? So his was a very short answer. If you want to study the container, do a CT. But if you want to study the contents, do an MRI. Thank you very much for your hearing. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next talk, which is going to be by Dr. Pradeep Sharma. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, sir, here. And as uh, sir is getting ready, let me also inform all of you that we are going to have our third annual conference of Indian Neuroophthalmological Society. It's uh, planned on 23rd and 24th of October. We are hoping to have a hybrid conference. The physical location of the conference is going to be JLN Auditorium at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And uh, the virtual location of the conference will be shared soon. The further details on inosindia.com. We have lots of uh, very renowned international faculty who have agreed to be part of this uh, conference. And we also have hands-on at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So see you there. And we invite uh, Pradeep Sharma, sir, for a beautiful lecture on cranial nerve pulses. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. Uh, we'll be talking about cranial nerve palsies. I think part of it has already been covered by Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Naveen. Uh, we have 12 cranial nerves that we are, uh, but nine of them deal with the eyes, but we are only going to talk about the three major ones which are dealing with ocular motility. I have no financial disclosures to make in this. As we all understand as postgraduates that incompetent strabismus may be spastic, paralytic, or restrictive, and in paralytic, it may be neurogenic or myogenic, and even sometimes a neuromuscular junction. And palsy is a term which is overall used for both paresis, which is partial and total when it is paralytic. Involving a nerve, then we call it a fascicular. When it is involving the nucleus part, we call it a nuclear palsy. And when it is involving the horizontal gaze, it is called a gaze part. It may be congenital or acquired. We have to think cortically. We have to have the anatomy in our mind whenever we have to deal with the patient with paralysis and the intracranial nerve course, which should be clear in our minds, the internuclear connections that may be there and also the intraorbital course. The causes of nuclear palsy could be ischemia, infiltration because of a tumor, a trauma, inflammation, compression by a tumor or a demyelinating disease. Now let's come to cases. Now, when we have a case who presents with a head posture and the face turn to the left is there. Ocular deviation indicates an esotropia. Movements are limited and we think it's an abduction uh, limited. So it's possibly a sixth nerve palsy. We should document our movements, under actions and over actions very clearly. There are various ways of doing it. And as well, we are examining for under actions and over actions of inferior oblique also are to be seen. When we are dealing with the investigation, we should differentiate between the ocular investigations in the form of diplopia charting and the HES charting and the systemic investigations. The diplopia charting, which is done with the red over the right eye and green over the left eye glasses, they will be able to chart out for a typical sixth nerve palsy, a fourth nerve palsy, or a third nerve palsy, as these are very classically seen. But remember, you should use a slit as a target, and uh, this will tell you if there is any torsion, and always use the slit vertical for horizontal palsies and horizontal slit for vertical palsies. The HES charts can help us in uh, knowing what is the excursion of the fellow eye as per the innervation demand of the paralytic fixing eye. These are the typical HES charts which may be seen, for example, in the sixth nerve palsy. And if there is a uh, fresh case of sixth nerve palsy versus a late, we can differentiate on the basis of HES charts. The other test which we may do clinically is the force duction test or the passive duction test, which is done under topical anesthesia. Uh, the limbus is grafts with the pre preferably appears Hoskins or non-tooth forceps. And the, we are basically testing for a movement passively, which is there or not. This test is very, very useful 
even intraoperatively, we will keep on doing at each step. The exaggerated force reduction test for superior oblique and the inferior oblique less commonly is also done. Another test which is done is the active force generation test, which is also done under topical anesthesia. And this may help us in uh, letting know whether after a force reduction test being positive, we have to distinguish whether it is a secondary contracture or a primary restrictive problem. The tug will be felt if the nerve, um, muscle is normal and it's a restrictive stabismus. There are uh, Scott forceps and differential tonometry is another one which will help us in dealing with the restrictive strabismus. Of course, the fresh cases will show a pass pointing, but something which we'll always have to remember is the field testing, which may be done as a confrontation fields in your OPD setup itself, and always look at the papilledema whenever you have a suspicion of a palsy. The binocular diplopia free fields are usually missed by most of the ophthalmologists. These are very important for ocular motility uh, prognostication, we can see how much is the diplopia free fields binocularly, and this will help us in monitoring these cases like a blow out fracture cases when we are following the cases. In a case of a typical nerve palsy, the history is important. This will help us in guiding what tests to do. The systemic investigations, the common suspects, of course, are the hypertension. So we should always ask for a blood pressure assessment, a blood sugar, fasting, postprandial, and HbA1c, a lipid profile. Uh, homocysteine, which is again a very common thing which is happening nowadays, ESR and CRP, and specific investigations when required. Uh, in a study done by us at RP Center, we had seen that in the ischemic mononeuropathies, the most common culprit was the diabetes, and hypertension was the next, and the hyperlipidemia was close. And in various combinations, these can be affected. We should always rule out myasthenia gravis. And whenever we have a case with diurnal variation, variable presentation, a pupil sparing paralysis, although in the literature, there are cases reported even involving pupil, but these are as exceptions. Unexplained pattern of paralytic strabismus, we should always think about myasthenia gravis. And you can do a simple ice pack test in your clinic itself to see if there is a suspicion confirmed. Uh, Neostigmine test is the next thing forward. And electromyography, for repeated nerve stimulation can be ordered. And same way, we can also look for anti-ACHR, anti-musk, and anti-titan antibodies for myasthenia gravis. Neuroimaging has been dealt by Dr. Naveen very nicely. I wouldn't go into the details, but these are the uh, things when we are dealing with paralytic restrictive, but also for acute concomitant strabismus. Mind you, nowadays we may get cases because of COVID having uh, acute isotropia, we may require to do imaging. And similarly, for CCDDs, at times we may do imaging. So a third nerve palsy case. Now, if, if these are typically, we know that if the pupils are involved or not, what do we do? If it's a pupil sparing case, then we should investigate for ischemic causes, mainly the hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia, or homo, raised homocysteines. Observe for at least five days if there is no involvement of pupil, because there may be a delayed pupillary involvement, and recheck every four to six weeks. Recovery usually begins in these ischemic cases within six weeks and completes by three months. If there is no recovery or the pupil starts dilating in the first week or there are additional neurological signs or you see an aberrant regeneration or a progression of a palsy, do an immediate MRI or MRA as per the case requirement. If pupil is involved and imaging is negative, also go forward for a lumbar puncture. So when to do imaging, MRI, MRA, all pupil involving cases. Also pupil sparing if the case is less than 50 years, incomplete nerve palsies, follow-up shows pupil involvement, additional neurological features, I'm just repeating, and children less than 10 years, aberrant regeneration and not improving in three months. In third nerve palsies, it may be a nuclear or a fascicular and a clinical uh, presentation will guide us what could be there, but you can do uh, imaging to confirm your suspicions. Uh, as you all know, the nuclear third nerve palsies, the sparing of uh, unilateral ptosis and unilateral involvement of pupils is the typical thing. Whenever pupils or ptosis is in involved, it is always bilateral if it is a nuclear involvement. So these associated features of contralateral hemiplegia, ataxia, tremor, or hemiplegias and ataxial tremor combined, these should again lead you to do in an uh, investigation of MRI or imaging. Whenever you suspect a cavernous sinus or a keratico cavernous fistula, look for it. Any trauma, you should always look for. There may be associated third and fourth nerve palsies, which you can see. Examining a fourth nerve palsy in the presence of third nerve palsy for the sake of PGs 
it's a very simple thing ask the person to look down and focus your attention to the nasal vessel and you can see the intorsion of a nasal vessel which confirms the fourth nerve is free aberrant regenerations as i talked about should be seen for these cases and will help you in management also uh, algorithm for transposition again fourth generation test we did talk about another test which will be helpful is saccadic velocity analysis if it is available otherwise you can do a clinical assessment of that and that will help you in guiding what surgery to do a simple r and r or r and plication or a transposition procedure that you may be trying to do in these cases look for convergence in cases of internuclear ophthalmoplegia it will help you differentiate uh, whether it is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia because there the convergence is spared Modi and for six nerve palsy again we will look for associated syndromes which may be there in the form of sixth and seventh nerve involvement or a contralateral hemiplegia involvement remains with sixth nerve and contralateral hemiplegia together or foveans so if these you have then you should look for the test and in some cases you may also have to look for the possibilities of toxic optic neuropathies or nutritional deficiencies in the form of vitamin b12 so these cases we will be managing and uh, my follow up speaker dr sarav jain is going to talk about in detail but we are just going to say that strabismus fixus convergence cases you may have to do an imaging in order to differentiate cases of sagging eye heavy eye or a knobby eye which may be dealt with differently in cases of strabismus fixus we now know that there may be a heavy eye as described by yokoyama in which loop of uh, myopexy would be done between the lateral rectus and superior rectus when do we do that when we'll see the nasalization of the superior rectus and the inferior rectus in the orbit coronal views and the lateral rectus is in the inferior compartment in superior oblique palsies your clinical tests will help you guide and as we talked about we also need to do a fundus assessment to look for a torsion even in a child we can pick up a binocular or bilateral superior oblique palsies should not be missed if there is a history of head trauma a torsion if there is subjectively complained of objective torsion more than 10 degrees or there is an alternating hypertropia test on the alternating head tilt a v pattern typically an eso in down gaze would always mean there is a bilateral superobic palsy and we will manage it differently finally cranial disinnervation disorders which are nowadays the new name for the earlier called musculofacial anomalies which may be the neuropathies of third fourth and sixth nerves in the form of duanes a mobius or congenital fibrosis extraocular muscles or a brown syndrome may also require imaging as these tests are indicating the absence of six nerve in drs in cfum a missing third nerve and a mobius six and seventh nerve is missing synergistic divergence is another condition in which you can do a dynamic mri meaning thereby that we will image the orbits in different gazes and we will see the co contraction of the lateral rectus by seeing the enlargement of the size of the uh, in cross section of the lateral recti and similarly a synergistic innervational down shoot which will be seen by the in, in the inferior rectus becoming thicker on the imaging so these are the thing which will help us in managing it differently to conclude i would say we have to think cortically we have to be squint intellectuals dealing with a nerve palsy and we can then bring back the binocularity in these cases thank you all for a patient listening thank you very much sir for those uh, excellent uh, words on how to work up how to examine and our uh, way to understand any patient of a cranial nerve palsy coming to us uh, we'll now quickly move to our keynote speaker uh, dr saurabh jain who uh, has as i mentioned all the way from uk he's just managed to escape being quarantined by just today he is a consultant ophthalmologist and clinical director at the royal free hospital london and is the training program director for ophthalmology at health education england so uh, welcome dr saurabh and uh, please uh, your presentation thank you very much dr saxen for the introduction and it's such an honor to be part of this esteemed faculty thank you also for all the excellent talks that have preceded me and i have to say dr mahesh and dr sharma has done most most of my work for me because the important thing before you do any operation is to make sure you have a good work up and you know exactly what you're dealing with and it never has it been more obvious or more important than for cranial nerve palsies 
So just uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, I did my initial training here in Delhi. So it's such a pleasure to be back here. Uh, I was in GNEC and then now I work at UCLH at Royal Free at London and I teach at UCL where I'm an associate professor. So it's a real honor to be back here in Delhi with you all today. Uh, so we talked about the third, the fourth and the sixth kernel nerves. And the thing we all know uh, and we understand is that the third, the fourth and the sixth nerves are are located quite close to each other in the brainstem and they carry out the synergistic movements and they communicate ipsi and contralaterally and they do this using the medial longitudinal fasciculus so they they subserve the uh the uh saccades the uh pursuit movement but also there's a lot of wiring that takes place that is behind the vestibular ocular reflex. Basically, when you tilt your head from right to left, your eyes tilt from left to right. And so there's a lot of wiring that things can go wrong. And today I'm going to talk mostly about the cranial nerve palsy. So I'll start with the third nerve. The third nerve cranial nerve palsy, well, let's illustrate this with the case. is a five month old girl who I saw when I was doing my fellowship with Irene Gottlob in Leicester. And she came to us with the eye that looked like this and outwards and downwards deviation with the ptosis. So very, very obviously a left uh, congenital cranial third nerve palsy. Now, the one thing to remember is any kind of cranial nerve palsy, but especially the third nerve, any surgical treatment is very challenging because you have global limitation of the extraocular motility. And the way I explain it to parents, to patients is you live your life in nine boxes. So one, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And really, if we can get you straight in straight gaze and down gaze, we've done the majority of what we want to do. Anything else is a bonus. And they have to accept that there will be limited motility of the involved eye. And I think that's really important to manage expectations before you go knife to eye. Because once you've done that, it's very, very difficult to, to be able to, to, you know, to do that. So what can you do for these patients? The, there are many options. And what we know in medicine, there are many options. There's no one good option. Yeah, you could do a big recession resection with or without traction sutures and combine this with a NAP procedure to lift the eye up to, uh, to eliminate the vertical. You can supplement this with uh, injections of toxin either in preoperatively or intraoperatively, or you can use globe tethering procedures. So what you can do, you can take a superior oblique and, and put it anterior to the MR insertion, or you can fix it for the LR to the periosteum and the MR to the globe. So for this uh, girl, we, we did a uh, transmission of the superior oblique tendon. And essentially what you do is you take the superior oblique tendon from where it's attached normally, temporal to the uh, SR, and you take it un under the SR and attach it medially just before the MR. I have to say, it's not always the best procedure. You get a limited uh, amount of improvement for a short time. And after that, you know, uh, things can go back to normal. So. So this is what she looked like. She was quite good. And as far as I know, she, she did quite well. But you see, again, don't get a lot of motility in, in down gaze. This is the uh, periosteal fixation I was talking about. You fixate the LR to the lateral orbital wall, and you fixate the MR to the anterior lacrimal crest. I have to say, I don't like this procedure. You get a really poor postoperative appearance. The eye is completely frozen, and it's not very cosmetically acceptable. I think this operation changed everything for me. This was uh, described by person from Turkey. And what she did was she split the LR into two and this was threaded through and attached to the MR. And I, I find this technique works really well. It takes a little bit of planning and you have to choose your patients properly, but I think this, this, can, this can be done quite nicely. Uh, this is the paper by Linda Dargi. And I was just talking, I mean, she's talking very kindly at a British meeting in two days from now. And she was telling me now they take off the SO and the IO when they do this procedure so that it's a little bit more easy to thread these, these two, two bits of LR down to the MR. And it works really well. The key thing though, is you cannot do it if the pre LR has had a previous operation or it's fibrosed or uh, there is any any other previous surgery because you just need a strong, supple, but very elastic LR. Okay, I'll move on quickly to the fourth nerve. Pulse. This is what we all see a lot of. So fourth nerve is an interesting nerve. It's the only one that emerges from the dorsal part of the midbrain, the only one that crosses almost straight after it emerges. And it's a very long, thin nerve. So you do get fourth nerve palsies quite frequently. This is a 30 year old man who came to me with vertical diplopia as long as, as he could remember. And you know, the diagnosis is usually is not difficult. We like these in the exams because residents, there's a lot of 20% of residents to, so to elucidate, 
So nothing in primary gaze, but as soon as it looks to the right, you will see a huge amount of vertical deviation that tells you what's going on. So you look into the right and there it is, a big vertical deviation, a left or a right. Now I'm very lucky, I work with some fantastic orthoptists and I make sure that all my patients, especially the incompetent ones, get a three, uh, get a nine gaze measurement on a sign up to four. And this is really key if you're going to plan surgery. And this is, this is what this guy looked like. So first line, horizontal, second one vertical, third line, uh, uh, torsional. And you can see he has a huge left hypertropia, more in dextroversion, most in dextro depression, with an X cyclo in, in all directions of gaze, again, more in down gaze. So when you ask any of us who do swing surgery, what you do for a fourth nerve palsy, I think our default always is trying to do the IO if you can. If, if the deviation is much more in down gaze or there's a lot of torsion, you really want to either work on the SO. And if they've done these already, then you really want to work on the SR on the other eye. So that's my usual uh, scheme of surgical planning. That's the order in which I, which I go in. So um, I, I have to say, I've stopped doing infraoblique myectomies now or, or almost completely in which you hook, hook the muscle and you divide it into two. I take about, about an inch of the muscle uh, to, so that uh, you, you get really good infraoblique weakening. My default operation for infraoblique weakening now is an infraoblique an enterization, which in which you take the infraoblique and you attach it right next to the inferior rectus. So in this diagram, it's actually going ahead. I try and avoid that. You really do not want to get the inferior oblique ahead of the inferior rectus at all, because you will give this person an anti-elevation syndrome. So you have to be very careful, especially when you hook the muscle and you pull it towards you. It's quite easy to get confused that, uh, about where the insertion lies. So look for the blood vessels at all the residents. Do not go anterior to the inferior rectus if, if you can. Okay. So we published this paper in JPOS just this year, looking at, uh, so I used to do my activities before and I switched to um, and transposition a few years ago, and we looked at our patients, um, and essentially we find with IOAT, you, we get a better control of the deviation, and it tends to last longer. And we haven't seen any patients with anti-elevation as long as you remember not to go anterior to the inferior rectus. If you're going to operate on the on the superior oblique, it's really important to just make sure the tendon is loose. But the tendon is not loose. You have to be really careful doing a tuck because you will give them a really poor Brown syndrome. So you absolutely have to make sure the tendon is lax before you do it. There are many ways to do a superior oblique tuck. I have to say, I don't use a tucker, mostly because I don't have one. I just use a squint hook and I titrate it myself. And what you really want to see is that the, this is the FDT before, when you push it, push pulling the eye all the way up. And once you finish, you should be able to pull the eye just to just the inferior margin of the limbus, such as this line between the medial and lateral canthi, and no more than that. Also, no less than that. So you have to warn this patient, you're going to give them a Brown syndrome. And that's okay for most people, but if your patient is a keen cyclist, so if they use the, the drop handle cycle bars, or they do a, a lot of painting of, 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 of things that are high up, you have to be, you have to make them aware of this. Okay. Um, these are some other papers that have talked about using superior oblique tuck as a primary procedure. In my hands, I really prefer the inferior oblique, but if the deviation is more in down gaze, or there's a lot of torsion, then absolutely superior oblique tuck can be a really powerful and very, very effective procedure. This is another study by my, my colleagues, John Durnian and Marsh from Liverpool. And again, they did uh, this will be talk for a quiet palsy. And again, this, this is a brave thing to do. So you have to be sure to do a superior oblique uh, FDT before, and you only tuck tendon that are very loose, or if you're going to do a tuck in an acquired SOP, do a small tuck. Okay. Um, here's, here's another paper by Raul Bola, who most of you know, who worked with Rosenbaum. And again, they, uh, they did tucks in both acquired as well as congenital superior oblique palsy. So really when it comes down to inferior oblique versus superior oblique, the things, the, what I take in, into account, inferior obliques are technically much easier. And I, I hardly do any squint operation on my own because I'm always, I always have a fellow or a resident. So it's a much easier procedure to teach. But if the deviation is much more in down gaze and distortion, you have to consider doing a superior oblique. So any good trepidologist should know how to do a tuck. And the key thing is the right operation for the right patient at the right time. Okay. So we'll move on to sixth nerve palsy. Now, sixth nerve palsy, um, as Dr. Sharma very uh, 
nicely showed, you know, especially congenital palsy can present quite acutely. This is a child who came to me with, uh, because the mom, he'd been taken for vaccination. The mom found he'd, he'd uh, adopted a, a, a head turn to the left. And you can see here, he's trying to look to the left and there's a bit of a limitation of left abduction. So he has a left six nerve palsy. The key thing in children is all canal of palsy, you have to scan them really because there's a much higher preponderance of neoplasm and raised ICP compared to a vascular cause. Also, was the, one question we ask all postgraduates, what, what would you check if there was a cranial nerve palsy? The, the answer is all the other cranial nerves, especially in children, that is very, very true because they can frequently get an involved cranial nerve palsy. So this is my case, 77 year Caucasian man with an eight month history of double vision. And this, so these are the measurements in all nine cases. The right isotropia, and this is what he looks like. So he's got a significant right isotropia, the limitation of right abduction. So this is my uh, little normogram for signal palsy. It all depends on the LR function. If there is LR function, then fine. You can do a recess resect procedure. How do you find that out? By fourth generation test. So I just put a cotton bud on the outer corner, ask them to look out and see how much force it generates. If there is if there is not enough force, so there's contracture of the MR, you need to do something different. So if you do an MR recession, or if there is no, there, if there is no point in resecting a dead muscle. You have to do then a transposition procedure. Okay, so you can do toxin to the MR to check how much contracture in the MR there is, and then plan a transposition procedure. These are the ones we we talk about routinely. I have to say I don't like any of them because they all have significant complications associated with them, especially problem with redo and possible anti-segment ischemia. So this was the paper that changed really how we approach these patients, like the crouch procedure when you do a superior rectus transposition only. So you can do this without a, with or without an MR recession. And we found that just a superior transposition can correct with 30 diopter, 30, 30 diopter. If you, more, if you want more, then you can, you can do a, a MR recession. And this is what it looks like. So here, you're only moving two muscles. So you, there's a less chance of an ASI. And there's a paper again by Linda Dagi. And this is what I and this is what I did for my, my chap. So I did a inferior crouch procedure, and you see it did have quite fact, it's a tiny exo, if anything. You can do an inferior rectus transposition, sort of a superior rectus one, but that really works more better for people who have a preoperative hypertropia or in torsion, because then you can correct that. If you don't have that, I prefer a superior rectus transposition. And then the last thing to talk about, and this I learned from Dr. Sharma at one of the APOS meetings, was a Nishida procedure, and in which uh, and this is what I do. I do simplified Nishida, in which you just only doing it, just pulling the SR and the IR laterally by using a non available suture. And I use the rule of 10, 10, 10. So 10 millimeter from the insertion, 10 millimeter from the limbus. And you really want to just pull the muscles to the side. And I found in my hands, it's very, it's very simple. It's quite atraumatic. You, you can avoid the anticillary vessels. It, it's com completely vessel sparing. And Without MRI session, can correct up to 30. With, I can correct up to 50. So I really, really like that procedure. And that's become a procedure of choice for six nerve palsy, really, I have to be honest. So, so, so I'd just like to thank you for the invitation. And I've just gone a little bit above, above time. So apologies for that. And thank you again for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, I think we've very nicely covered all cranial nerve palsies, their workup. So we still have a, a bit of a time, I think. Any comments or uh, any observations? Dr. Pradeep Sharma, Dr. Goel, and then anybody else? Yeah, I think just a uh, uh, thing about, uh, thing, when Dr. Naveen nicely presented uh, the indications of the CT or ultrasound, he highlighted the importance of ultrasound but I think the message should not go that if you have a cystic circus or scolex seen on ultrasound, you don't have to do CT. You need to do a CT or an MRI to rule out a neurocystic sarcosis because your albendazole treatment would only be possible if you have no neurocystic sarcosis involvement. So a CT may, imaging may still be required after an ultrasound done for confirming uh, the cystic sarcosis. Great. Uh, that. In all supranuclear pulses, you will never have diplopia. Diplopia mm -hmm. is seen only in nuclear and supranuclear pulses. Right. So if you have a gaze limitation, then of course you are uh, not going to have diplopia, but you're going to have a gaze <laughs> limitation. Yeah. Dr. Krishna, welcome. 
uh, any comments on all the talks we've had some wonderful talks during the course of the session yes uh, most of the talks are so excellent and i was totally uh, blown away by the the quality of the talks and the completeness so there's hardly much anything much to uh, add to them of course uh, dr solodrain it's a pleasure listening to you and um, of course we would use a, i would personally use a lot of chemo innovation for uh, you know for uh, for, uh, for 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 cranial palsy is involving the extracellular muscles and uh, in the, with or without associations with you know with surgery but it minimizes the amount of surgery it tends to keep the uh, the patient uh, you know uh, tend to have uh, you know the fusion is uh, attained much faster and one of the most important things i've noted i mean which what has been reported in literature too uh, chemo denovation almost immediately restores the gamma efferents so therefore the perceptual uh, perceptual fusion mechanism tends to work much faster so therefore the, the amount of diplopia tends to go off almost in the third to the sixth day and uh, so i think chemo denovation is one thing which is not been talked about in a great deal but i would personally feel that it's uh, of great uh, use particularly in in six nerves and third nerves and of course it's very difficult to use it in a fourth nerve yeah. uh, you rohit know, you have any experience of fractional prisms and where are they available in delhi uh we have uh, we have access to fractional prisms from we managed to get it from uh, the uh, you know the madhu in instruments we managed to get the whole sheet of fractional prisms from them so which could be which could be cut up and used for uh, for most patients but of course as i said chemo denovation with chemo denovation the use of fractional is uh, fairly limited except for vertical diplopias you know and fourth nerves can i just make a quick comment if that's yeah. okay but krishna that is, i completely agree with you i'm sorry i should have maybe uh, focus on that a little bit more you know that really has to be one of the things you consider first and in fact i spend all my time with the telling residents if you see a microvascular six don't just send them away for three months consider a toxin to the mr because as you rightly say firstly it makes the deviation a lot smaller so even if you do frenal then you may want to use a much smaller Fennel, because anything more than 15 diopter fennel really is an occluder. There's no point using more than 15 diopter. But secondly, it prevents a contracture of the MR. So you might end up not having to do so much surgery. Uh, and similarly, in a third, yes, I know it's more difficult because you only left two muscles to, to toxin, but you can do that. I completely agree. So, uh, yes, Virendra, you have a couple of comments and then I guess Mahesh and then we'll close up probably. Uh, thanks dr rohit it was wonderful talk uh, about the surgical management i was wondering like with uh, the world changing towards split transposition of lr to mr what do you not think that like one of the thing is uh, the lr should be free so should we all try to give botox to lr in patients with acute thyroid palsy that would make it less fibrous Uh, I have actually, I have actually tried it in a lot of patients uh, with acute traumatic thyroid nerve, and uh, they actually had better recovery of the AD deduction, and as a result, I could actually escape with a lesser surgery. That was uh, my observation. My no, observation. actually, there are reports that uh, you know, just giving the injection into the lateral rectus tends to cause local sprouting and almost the entire the global local sprouting. Actually, it's a the sprouting occurs not just in the lateral rectus but also in other areas the second important effect of a chemo denovation is as i said the gamma efferents the gamma efferents are immediately you know they tend to be altered so the perceptual uh, spatial perception is also altered it tends to restore the uh, you know fusional mechanism and tends to improve the fusional mechanisms in a way in a way we have noted i i totally agree with you in the case of third nerve that would be the first thing i would do i mean i would definitely not wait for uh, such a long time and we have very many success stories i mean it's been i've been doing chemo denovation for the past i mean almost uh, since 1999 since we first got in fact i didn't have botox at that point of time in india i was the, i used perhaps i had i used disport first 1999 so since then i've been using chemo denovation and uh, it's amazing believe me it's i would that would be the first thing i would like to do
before anything else. And it certainly reduces the amount of surgery. It sometimes totally obviates the need of surgery. It also tends to restore the binocular function to normal almost immediately. In the third to sixth day, it's almost there. You know, so it's, and it also enhances the recovery. I mean, the recovery is also much faster. I have to say, Dr. Krishna, I don't know what you found. Toxining the LR is a lot more tricky, I think, than toxining the MR. The MR is a nice, big, thick muscle. It doesn't matter what you do, you get a good effect. With the LR, you have just, I think, a lot more careful. And I find myself guiding the residents' hands a lot more in the LR than I do with the MR. Because the MR doesn't matter what they do. I, we always get an effect. Very true. Very true with that. In fact, uh, when we first started injecting the LR, we would use the uh, EMG with sonic, sonic uh, feedback. Of course, with time, we've stopped you doing that. But uh, yes, LR is a little trickier because of the thinner muscle. But, uh, but we've, we've had uh, case reports and we've also demonstrated that it's not essential to actually go into the muscle. You know, we could actually go deep down, uh, you know, in the LR, if you're not able to get it, if you're not able to do it, keep the bevel towards the sclera and inject it way behind somewhere in the area where it, uh, you know there is an attachment to the late to the lateral canthal area just behind that behind the posterior tenons so that gives you a much more uh, um, you know a much more adept uh, much more uh, accurate placement of the injection and there's very little that can go wrong with uh, placing such a posterior placement because you're unlikely to cause a process you're unlikely to cause anything else i think that is very interesting because we use an emg for for all toxin it's just what it is you know and they spend a lot of time getting trying to get a signal from the lr and this usually with thin vd muscle i say you know don't wait i mean mr fine but mr lr is just but i think I, I will try that actually i will try and inject more posteriorly and see see how we go thank you for that tip so i think we should call it day now uh, i think we've completed uh, all the major the completed all the topics that we set out to and some very nice interesting discussion in the end so thank you everybody for participating in the INO session in DOS. I particularly thank uh, our speakers and especially Dr. Saurabh Jain for the keynote and uh, everybody for a very, very interesting discussion. And uh, thank you very much. And I hope we see you again at the INOS conference uh, near the end of the month. And thank you everybody. And thank you DOS for the opportunity. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for wonderfully moderating all the sessions and also to all the speakers for their uh, wonderful presentations. Thank you once again. Um, we shall now log off from Hall M. Thank you, everyone.